Hello and welcome to the Under Centre podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Darren Martin. I am joined by uh, Fionn Malloy and Jake Woolhead. Guys, how are we this week? Yeah, not doing too bad. I'm um, just sort of half watching the Ireland Qatar match for some reason, even though I don't watch the, the sport, <laughs> but you know. <laughs> Is it a wrong sport to be talking about on this Absolutely. podcast, Jake? A crap sport, sport as well, we can all say. <laughs> We have uh, another packed show for you guys this week. We're continuing our off-season series, and this week it's the turn of the Atlanta Falcons, and we are delighted to be joined by host of the Locked on Falcons podcast, Aaron Freeman. How are you, Aaron? I'm doing great, guys. I'm really happy to be here. I will happily admit the number one reason why I agreed to do this podcast is I just enjoy listening to Irish accents. So I enjoy, <laughs> we, I'm looking forward will, to this conversation we're going to have. We will absolutely <laughs> take that. <laughs> that is absolutely no problem because any guests, most of the guests that we've had in this series have said the exact same thing. So <laughs> it's totally okay. Don't worry about that. Before we get uh, into the show, if you are watching this on YouTube, can you please uh, like this video and subscribe to the Dynamo Podcast Network? Uh, That is where you will find the podcast each and every week. If you're listening to us on the audio version, it's the same thing. subscribe i should say to the dynamo podcast network wherever you get your podcast you'll find us there each and every week as well so you can listen there too but let's get straight into talking about the atlanta falcons and aaron i'm just going to ask you quickly about the 2020 season that we've just had and because it was a bit of a uh tumultuous time you could say for if you for a Falcons fan you know started off poorly you could say you were involved in a lot of entertaining games including the game against the Bears at home where they let a lead slip late on to Mitch Trubisky and then again the following week with the Cowboys with that crazy onside kick which should have been recovered wasn't recovered and they ended up winning the game yeah, so also the, the firing of head coach Dan Quinn and GM uh, Thomas Dimitrov mid-season, Raheem Morris came in to sort of steady the ship for the end of the year. So like, if you can sort of sum that up, uh, like, what was it like uh, as a Falcons fan in 2020? It was tough. It was tough. Uh, you know, it feels like we, we've been kicked a lot over these last couple of years from the football gods, but you know, the thing with Dan Quinn, he he had a slow start in the 2019 season, started off one and seven, didn't finish strong with the team able to sort of rally back to a seven and nine record. And that was enough. And they were able to win some games late against some quality teams like the Saints and 49ers that year that led to the expectations that that's the real Falcons. And if they can get back to a similar start uh, as they finished the previous year, that they would be able to get back into the playoff mix. And as you uh, so far explained, that was not the case this year, starting off 0-5, which led to the firing of Dan Quinn. Why they sort of started off slow, you know, if I knew the answer to that, then I would probably not be here doing this podcast. Um, But like, I, I think, you know, they just couldn't, figure it out their defense has been up and down their offense has been struggling the last couple of years since they uh were losing Kyle Shanahan who's now the head coach of the 49ers and they just haven't been able to really get back on track to their success that they had earlier in the Dan Quinn era and I think you know a big element for that this past year was they had some injuries uh, particularly to Julio Jones and early in the season, whenever Julio Jones was out of the lineup, despite having players like Matt Ryan and Hayden Hurst and, and Calvin Ridley, who had a, a breakout year in part due to the injuries to Julio Jones, the offense just did not seem to click uh, all that much. It, they were better down the stretch. And that was a contributing factor to some of their early struggles because Julio Jones was dealing with a hamstring injury for most of the season, missed chunks of the first five, six weeks, and then basically missed the last month of the season due to that hamstring. So that didn't help them. And and their defense had some positive moments, particularly during the middle of the season when Raheem Morris initially took over as the head coach. Uh, he was calling plays for the team in the first five games when Dan Quinn was the head coach, but it just seemed like the team and the defense 
did respond better to him uh, once he became the head guy. And that led to the defense playing better down the stretch, but it still was very inconsistent. And I think part of that was just some of the teams that they face, you know, Kansas City, Tampa Bay, Green Bay were some of the offenses that they faced this year. And those offenses just had no problems picking them apart. And we even saw lesser offenses, as you mentioned, the Cowboys and the Bears, particularly in the second halves of those games, were able to pick them apart. And so the Falcons just couldn't hold on the leads. And it just was a very inconsistent season, uh, which has been sort of the story of the Falcons these last couple of years. Yeah, and obviously now you've got Arthur Smith in as the new head coach and Terry Fontenot, I, I hope I'm pronouncing the second name correctly there. You got it. Uh, perfect. Uh, as the new GM, what are your early impressions of the duo? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because this offseason, because of all the sort of COVID stuff and, you know, you, you're not getting as much access to personnel in organizations as you normally would get normally we would have had the combine and that would have been an opportunity for coaches and general managers of every NFL team to get up in front of the media and talk about what their plans are and all these various things we didn't get that this year um so my first impressions of Arthur Smith and, and Terry Fontenot so far have been pretty favorable but it, it, it does feel like they're kind of more at more arm's length than you know we would normally get at this point in the calendar year. So it's, it's kind of a guessing game to a certain extent with those guys in terms of what they could bring. I think obviously they check a lot of the boxes that you're looking for. And with Arthur Smith coming from an offense uh, in Tennessee, that was one of the highest scoring offenses in the league. Um, and it was also one of the most consistent red zone offenses in the league, which was a big contributing factor to why the Falcons offense struggled this past year, as they were one of the worst red zone offenses in the league in 2020. It's sort of a match made in heaven that you're going to have Arthur Smith coming from a system in Tennessee that he kind of inherited from Matt LaFleur, currently the head coach in Green Bay, but a system that Matt LaFleur learned under Kyle Shanahan. And the last time the Falcons really had that type of play calling, we saw Matt Ryan have an MVP season. We saw the Falcons guide, uh, you know, all the way to the Super Bowl. So, you know, Arthur Smith makes a, a ton of sense. And Terry Fontenot comes from an organization in New Orleans where they've been up against it from the salary cap standpoint these last couple of years. The Falcons are kind of up against it from the salary cap standpoint. So you get a guy that at least has, at least from afar, being, you know, a pro scouting director in New Orleans, has seen how that team has sort of managed you know, a tight salary cap space and, and been able to field competitive teams over the last four years. Um, and it makes a lot of sense for the Falcons to want that in a general manager. So they check a lot of boxes. Ultimately, we're just going to have to find out if they actually live up to those expectations once, you know, the actual games get played in a couple of months. Yeah. And obviously a big thing of the Titans offense was Derek Henry running over defenders left, right and center. There was issues with the running back position last year with, with Todd Gurley, who, who couldn't stay fit. We had uh, Brian Hill and Ido Smith there backing him up as well, but obviously they don't have the sort of, uh, I guess, the explosive running game that uh, a Arthur Smith-type offense in, in Tennessee would look like. Now, they have signed Mike Davis this offseason, what would you be expecting? Would that be something maybe that they could address in the draft that looking at maybe more of a, a powerhouse running back? Yeah, I, the expectation is that they will further supplement the running back position in the draft. It's just a question of when they'll do that. The addition of Mike Davis means that they don't necessarily have to get that guy in the first or second round of the draft. Maybe they can wait until the third or fourth round. And typically the way that drafts are set up, you can still get good running backs in those rounds that can contribute right away. And so one of the things that Arthur Smith has said multiple times is essentially, you know, Derrick Henry's not walking through that door. And they're not going to be able to just sort of hand the ball off to Derrick Henry and, and find success that way because the Falcons just are – the chances of them finding another Derrick Henry type of running back are extremely, extremely low, no matter how highly you think of some of these running backs in this upcoming draft. So they're sort of basically been saying that they're going to be committed to a committee system, at least in the short term. And Mike Davis is going to be a big part of that and potentially the biggest piece of that. And we saw him have success in Carolina last year, uh, filling in for Christian McCaffrey. He showed uh, that he can certainly be a guy that can take a significant portion of the workload and uh, often still be very effective, not only on the ground, and through the air but he also showed the more and more you watched it that like he's not the guy he can't be the guy that's going to be that sort of feature workhorse guy so I think that goes back to the earlier point of 
you still expect the Falcons to add more help in the draft and they'll just sort of have a committee of presumably that rookie Mike Davis, Ito Smith and in Quadri Olison and sort of the competition through camp will determine sort of how big a workload each one of those guys gets this upcoming season. But I, I don't think you're going to see, you know, someone just sort of completely dominate the, the, the carries this upcoming season for the Falcons. Yeah. And I- as well as other additions in free agency, because they have been quite quiet um, in, in compared to other teams, obviously. And they've added a few notable signings. We mentioned Mike Davis. Uh, Fabian Moreau was one. And interestingly, Bartavius Mingo is another who, as well as having the best name in football, <laughs> um, was part of the Patriots side that beat the Falcons in that Super Bowl. Um, so what have you made of the team signings this offseason? It seems to be more an emphasis of like cap management, like you were mentioning uh, Fontenot's uh, history with New Orleans. Yeah, they've been going for the cheap, uh, sort of close to veteran minimum type of contracts and trying to fill some key depth spots, get a couple of starters here or there, at least guys that they think can come in and compete for a starting spot in the event that they aren't able to find a rookie in this upcoming draft class that can come in right away and compete. And those are guys like Barkevius Mingo, like Eric Harris, the safety they signed from the Raiders. Uh, That guy could wind up starting. They were able to pick up Brandon Copeland, uh, the linebacker from the Jets. Uh, They also were able to get Lee Smith. They traded for him the tight end from Buffalo. Josh Andrews was an offensive lineman for the Jets. I'm sure I'm forgetting, you know, a a couple other guys. You mentioned Fabian Moreau. Um, So, a lot of those guys, you know, Copeland, uh, Smith, and, and Andrews are expected to fill death rolls, but guys like Murrow, Harris, Mingo could wind up starting. They'll certainly be in the conversation during the competitions uh, this summer, uh, and we'll sort of have to see how big a priority finding another pass rusher to tag team with Dante Fowler, or finding another safety and finding a, another corner is for the Falcons in the upcoming draft. But it's been a sort of try to get the most bang for your buck without having really any amount of money to spend. And I would say the Falcons have done a acceptable job trying to get those. They, they're getting guys that for the most part, this coaching staff that's coming in with Arthur Smith is familiar with. So they know what they're getting from these guys, even if it's not necessarily high level starting. Aaron, one guy that I find very interesting on the Falcons team and I'd like to get your opinion on is obviously Matt Ryan. And we've talked a little bit about the Super Bowl and and not quite making it, but getting all the way to that big game. He's not so far removed from that game, but he's 35 years old. Uh, I just want to know how secure do you think he is in in that seat uh, going forward? And would you like to see the Falcons try to start to address either bring in a young guy to sit behind him or maybe look to move on or are you happy with him being there under center for the next few years and we'll leave that problem uh, for a couple of seasons time yeah that's been the big question for the last several months and i don't have a definitive answer for you because some days i lean one way some days i lean the other way i was expecting the falcons to look at this draft class as a golden opportunity sitting at that number four overall selection with a four possibly five man uh quarterback class uh, depending on who you talk to uh, at the top of this draft and and just having one of those guys fall in your lap and you solidify that quarterback position for years to come um, and and sort of build around that guy and you kind of wash the taste out of the mouth of that 28 to three loss of of that era and it's not to say that that loss was on Matt Ryan in any shape or form he played well in that game as well as other players did but it's just sort of a stigma that's been hanging over this team for the last several years and potentially moving in another direction at that quarterback position would be the biggest move that you could make to sort of try to wipe away the past uh, in the words of uh, Kylo Ren, you know, kill the past, you know, let it die or whatever he says, if you have to, I butchered that line, but um, you guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, So, you know, I think with the Falcons, as far as the quarterback position, that was my expectation going into offseason. And then the Falcons kind of threw a wrench into that by doing their fourth restructure of Matt Ryan's contract uh, that they've done in the last five years. And they kind of needed to do it in order to get under the salary cap. Although you can debate whether they needed to, to restructure Matt Ryan's contract in that way um, to get under the salary cap. Uh, but they, they, at some point they were going to have to touch his contract and it just was a matter of how much they would try to save, but they went the full way. And, and now you're in a situation where Matt Ryan's got a $49 million cap hit in 2022 
And if the Falcons were to trade him, it would only lower it to $40 million. And that's a huge amount of money to carry on your salary cap, even if it is normal next season uh, and it's not affected by COVID. But that's a huge burden to carry on your salary cap um, for a guy that's not going to play a snap for you, which you would assume would be the scenario if the Falcons drafted a quarterback at four, that you're not going to sit that guy for two whole years. And so the Falcons are kind of in this dilemma where financially speaking, it makes more sense to just sort of bite the bullet. And even if you don't think Matt Ryan is going to be an elite quarterback, you know, these next couple of years and, and pull a Tom Brady or anything like that, that he's just going to give you a lot of value, you know, over the next couple of years and to ride that and see what you can get the most out of that in his twilight years for the next two to three or four years um, rather than taking quarterback. Um, but at the same time, if you're thinking long-term, if you're thinking, and if you're Terry Fontenot, if you're Arthur Smith and you're like, we're not as worried about our ability to win this year or next year, we're more worried about our ability to win, you know, four or five years from now, then it makes total sense for the Falcons to take a quarterback. So because, you know, I have the luxury of my job, not being on the line and I, you know, the Falcons going six and 10 is not going to affect my bottom line uh, in terms of whether I can pay my bills this year. Um, I tend to go for more of the long-term solution and, and taking the quarterback, but I wouldn't begrudge them if they decide, look, Matt Ryan's still a good quarterback. He's still capable of being a top 10 quarterback. And we believe that given our system with Arthur Smith was able to turn Ryan Tannehill, who was a below average starter into one of the more efficient quarterbacks in the league. We certainly can do the same thing for Matt Ryan over these next couple of years. And let's go out there and get a blue chip player. That's not a quarterback, like a pass catcher, like a tight end, like Kyle Pitts or an offensive lineman like Penny Sewell. And let's, you know, build it the right way around Matt Ryan, which you can argue the Falcons did not necessarily do despite some of the weapons that they had, but they kind of neglected the offensive line for several years. And that led to some of the issues that they've had on the offensive side of the ball these last couple of years. So, you know, it's an interesting conversation and it's going to be a conversation that I will continue to go back and forth on uh, until we find the answer out, you know, on April 29th when uh, round one of the draft hits. Yeah. And yeah. I I just I just want to ask you very quickly, sorry, um, about the, the draft, because we saw that the big trade last week with San Francisco going up to four and all the expectation is that they are going to draft a quarterback at number three. Do you think now with the Falcons of the F4, the pressure now is off Fontenot, Fontenot and uh, Smith, that they don't feel like they have to draft the quarterback. Now they can have a look at maybe a Jamar Chase or, like you said, a Kyle Pitts or maybe someone on the line. I think maybe it's going in the opposite direction. And that's a good question. I, I probably need to think about this a little bit more. But to a certain extent, I kind of think the 49ers trading what they traded to Miami now means that there's expectations that the Falcons should be able to get a similar haul by trading back. And if you don't trade back and you don't take a quarter, I think there's going to be a lot more questions around the Falcons if they stay at four and don't take a quarterback and they take a position player. I think there's going to be a lot more people being like, hmm, was it the right move to pass up on a quarterback there and take a position player that high? If you were going to take a position player, why not try to move back? Now, the question is whether or not they'll be able to move back because that will take somebody else also wanting to give up a 49er-like haul uh, multiple future first round picks in order to go up to four, which I tend to be very skeptical of. I thought the 49ers were the one team that was most likely to do that other than Carolina. And we kind of know that the Falcons are probably not going to trade with Carolina because they play in the same division. So you kind of needed the 49ers to make that deal with the Falcons as opposed to the Dolphins. But so I, I think to answer your question, I think it kind of puts more pressure on the team to take a quarterback at four if, the, if they wind up staying put there. Yeah, kind of. I had very similar questions to Fionn and, uh, and Dara's point on the draft as well. So I'll go, I'll add one little point to that and then add just uh, another question. Firstly, how much do you love Young Hui Ku? Is he not the best player on your team? I absolutely love the guy. He is fantastic. Um, and also, I have said this on the, the pod a few times that the Falcons should have blown up this team and started at the very start, should have traded away anybody they could have gotten any value out of it because I just don't think there's any point in them going 
um, nine and what is it now, nine and eight next year, um, get picking midway in the draft or whatever and, and not being able to do it. So I think they should go quarterback this year and they should start to think about life after Julio, life after Matt Ryan. Yeah, I think for that last point, I think you're right. Like, I can't argue against you. Um, it just it boils down to preference. It, it really kind of just boils down to how this regime, how much gas they think is left in those players' tanks uh, to whether or not they feel like, look, we, we, you know, the NFL stands for not for long. And we can't always guarantee that if we completely tear this thing down in, in two or three years, that we're going to be in a position to be able to win games. Um, so, you know, you potentially make the case that the better you are right away, the longer a leash you're going to potentially get long term. Um, as for Young Way Koo, uh, yeah, Young Way Koo was one of the few bright spots in the Falcon season this year. Um, unfortunately, he kind of left a, a little bit of a bitter taste in my mouth because he missed a kick against the Chiefs that could have sent that game in overtime. Not that I expected the Falcons to find, figure out a way to beat the Chiefs, but it was just one of those things where, like, as long as the Falcons could just keep this ruse going that they can beat a team like the Chiefs it at least is the biggest entertainment that I can have and, and him missing a chip shot late in that game it was just like this is and it, it's difficult with Young Way Koo because he's stepped into Matt Bryant's shoes who was a, a very successful kicker for the Falcons for a decade and was very consistent hitting those clutch kicks and Falcon fans like myself have gotten so used to just oh those are automatic kicks and then to see someone miss them it's like you know what's going on but uh yeah he, he he's great um, and uh, was, was there a third question you asked? I'm sorry. No, I just really wanted to know what you thought about Young Way Koo because I just think he's fantastic. His onside kick skill just blows my mind yes, every time yeah. I see him do it. Yeah, it is crazy. that It's either the, it's the one air. It's weird that the Falcons tend to be so unlucky uh, in all other things, but it seems like they're really good at recovering onside kicks. So either they're the luckiest team in a weirdly niche way <laughs> or they're like the unluckiest team but it kind of balances it out it's it's, it's just a, a very weird phenomenon but look I, i'm not complaining if if the falcons have a legitimate chance to recover an onside for like the the two times it's needed a season i'll, I'll take it yeah and, and then we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up soon but before we do we're coming into uh, i believe it's the last year of calvin ridley's rookie deal before he's eligible for a contract extension um would you like to see the falcons extend them and and secondly how how much do you think the market rate is going to be oh uh the second question is gonna be tough yeah it's, it's gonna be a big number um yeah i think i think they they should definitely try to extend them i, I think you have to plan for life after julio jones and it always seemed like with the recent contract that they gave to julio a couple of summers ago that it always sounded kind of lined up perfectly for him to play out this upcoming 2021 season in Atlanta, the Falcons could move on from him. And then that same off season, which would be next off season, um, pay Calvin Ridley, his contract and sort of just kind of like, okay, the future is now and have sort of Calvin Ridley, uh, you know, take the torch from Julio but lines up perfectly for the Falcons in terms of a number. I'm guessing at least $18 million a year in terms of what you're going to have to pay. I think we're quickly approaching an era where a, a lot of players at a lot of different positions are going to be making $20 million a year very soon. And it's just, it's a little jarring because in my brain, I can still remember the days where a, a player got paid $5 million a year and that was a huge contract. That's how old I am. But um, it is one of those things where it's like, I think you, at some point we just got to make peace that if you want to have a good player at a position, you got to pay him $20 million or more. Um, and I think Calvin really is certainly in that conversation uh, based off of how he played last year. And I think can continue to grow and, you know, still has several prime years left of his career. And, and certainly while may not be on the same level as Julio Jones at the height of his powers, I think certainly is a very good uh, wide receiver and, and certainly one of the best route runners in the league and capable of being in the conversation with guys like Devontae Adams and Stefan Diggs as, as one of the best route runners in the league in that level of wide receiver. So I think he's definitely worth the money. It's just going to be a matter of how much the Falcons think and how much Calvin Ridley thinks. And we'll probably find out the answer to that based off of how he performs this upcoming season in Arthur Smith's offense. Yeah, and um, lastly, we found out today, and it's been official, we kind of known it for a couple of weeks, that the uh, 17th game is coming to the NFL starting from next year. Uh, 
the way the uh, algorithm works, it looks like that the Falcons are going to be going to uh, Jacksonville to play the Jaguars in their extra game. Now, it could also be an international game um, because I know the Falcons were due to have their international game this coming season. Uh, the season just gone, so they might just postpone it for a year as well. But well, what do you think of the uh, 17th game? Is it something that you're in favour of? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think the get, before I get into that, I think it's an interesting quirk of the schedule that the Falcons might be facing potentially four out of the five rookie quarterbacks on top of this draft if, if it goes a certain way with Trevor Lawrence in Jacksonville, Zach Wilson with the Jets, uh, San Francisco now with whoever they wind up taking. And if Carolina winds up taking a quarterback, you know, at eight, there's a good chance that all those guys will be on the schedule. But as far as the 17th game, it, it seems like this has been the direction the league has been going in. Uh, and so I've made my peace with it. Uh, you know, despite all the concerns, the I think the legitimate concerns about player safety, guys can barely make it through a 16 game season. Uh, so, you know, every game that you add on to that is not helping in that regard. Um, you know, my biggest issue with it is not the, the expansion to 17 games. It's the fact that they didn't add an extra bye week. Like at least you could have thrown the players a bone and said, look, you get an extra day of rest and you're, you're never going to play more than eight games in a row or whatever the case may be. Um, but I, I'm, I'm assuming that here in the States we have NASCAR uh, and, and they have a big event every year, two weeks after the Super Bowl called the Daytona 500. And I'm, I'm imagining, I haven't heard any confirmation about it, but I assume that had they added two more weeks to the regular season uh, with an, a, a, a second bye week, that it would have wound up forcing the Super Bowl back two weeks, which would have then conflicted with that. So that's the reason why they didn't do it. Um, it's always financial in, in the end of the day. So, you know, I, I tend to be very cynical about it, but at the same time, like not so cynical where I'm like, oh, this is bad for the league. It's just, I think they could have done a better job, but look, I'm not going to wind up complaining with more football as most people are going to wind up being, it, it, you know, I, I joked with people a year ago. I can't even remember what the situation was, but it, it might've been, I don't remember what, Oh, the expansion of the playoffs. That's what it was. The seventh seed in the playoffs um, that we often complain about things in the NFL. And then we just go along with it. That's just the way that, you know, the, the take industry works where it's like, oh, the NFL is doing this terrible thing. But guess what? Just as many people are watching the games, more people are watching the game. So it's one of those things where it's become habitual to complain about things in the NFL. But at the end of the day, like, it's not that big a deal. Uh, so even if it sounds like I'm complaining about the 17th game, it's like, yeah, I'm fine with it. Yeah, I'm not going to see it's any fan. Anyway. Yeah, I'm not going to see any fans say, well, I'm only going to watch 16 regular season games this year and protest. <laughs> boycott, yeah. boycott. Yeah. Boycott game 17, hashtag boycott 17. But hashtag we can start. I mean, I won't yeah. do it, but we can start it. <laughs> I'm sure we'll have, we'll definitely have Alvin Kamara on our side anyway, because I think he's <laughs> yeah. been the most vocal so far against it. Um, well, listen, lastly, Aaron, before we let you go, where can people find uh, your podcast and socials? Yeah, they can find Locked On Falcons five days a week, Monday through Friday on whatever podcast platform you're listening to, your preferred podcast platform. And of course, if you want to get really snarky, but occasionally insightful uh, thoughts on the Atlanta Falcons, you can follow me on Twitter uh, at Falcfans. That's F-A-L-C-F-A-N-S. I mean, there's nothing I love more than a snarky comment on Twitter. <laughs> That's why you became a Giants fan. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on today, Aaron. Uh, we hope that we will be speaking to you again, if not before the start of the season, at some point during it, um, if you are interested in coming back on. Absolutely, guys. I uh, would love to chat with you guys later. Uh, perfect uh, that is it for this uh, show if you haven't already please subscribe to the Dynamo Podcast Network that is where you will find our podcast each and every week you also subscribe to the Dynamo Podcast Network wherever you get your audio podcast whether that be Apple Google Spotify wherever just search Dynamo Podcast Network you'll find us there and make sure you have a listen in there as well uh, but that is it for the show this week we are done and until we speak to you again stay safe